You know, 10 years ago, I was the unsexiest person by saying I'm a statistician. I had no future, right? Um, anyone in the quants feel, what are you going to study maths and stats? And all of a sudden, what happened? Ugh. You know, what do you do? All of a sudden, everyone this morning is talking about data. Wow. Artificial intelligence. Hmm. Image recognition. All the nice stuff. Where does it start, ladies and gentlemen? Data. Your data. It's interesting, Angela, you mentioned the behavioral economist. Behavioral economists believe that it's not about the size of the data, thankfully. It's rather the quality of the data. And that's still the same thing that works with big data and the Internet of Things, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll speed up my talk a little bit here to get through this here, but I'll quickly take you through what I was hoping to get through, is separating these concepts of big data and this thing called the Internet of Things. Um, I, I now commonly term it the Internet of Everything, and I think there's key problems that come with this. And that's what I'm going to talk about right at the end, around the key concerns and the opportunities that really sit. I'm going to take a different lens. There is some healthcare stuff in here, some of the Google flu train stuff that went horribly wrong, but also starting to look at it from an organizational perspective, corporate companies. How do we start really using this stuff to leverage value for both our consumers and users of our products and our services? Because I think there's been a lot of talk about big data. There's been a lot of talk about artificial intelligence. Let's talk about recommendation engines. I came across Amazon's recommendation engine probably about 15 years ago. And if you bought a toilet seat today, guess what they recommended to you tomorrow? Another one. How many toilet seats do you really need? <laughs> so we, we've been faltering a little bit on the, the recommendation engines, but this year was the first year that we've actually seen recommendation engines hit the bottom line of a company. And I'll show you some of those stats as well, because all of this is based on the ac accurate or good use of data. I'll take you through the strategic planning. I think we've missed the trick, ladies and gentlemen. I often get asked, can we come up with a data strategy? And I'm like, an organization only has one strategy, and that's your organizational strategy. Your data strategy feeds into it or assists it in its decision which markets and where to play. Simple as that. And so let's not elevate data further than it really can assist. It's always going to be a cost center in my, per, in my perspective, unless your recommendation engine can hit the bottom line, unfortunately. And that's what we've got to look at it as. I talk about data as being a bridge. That's all it is. It enables something similar to technology. And I think the question came up earlier. You know, it's great that we're seeing these technologies specifically on the emerging market context, the African continent. How are we using it? Tito Mbaweni's favorite country, Rwanda, is using technology. Drone technology in places where infrastructure is bad to deliver medicine, uh, blood. So how do we start using the technologies that we often see coming out of the West or the Western world? How do we use it, and please listen carefully to this, to solve needs in emerging markets? Because the West is often concerned with rather than solving needs, creating new markets. We need to be concerned more about servicing basic needs. When we can serve basic needs leveraging technology, we see efficiency, we see impact. That's what we see. When we look at how they're doing it in Rwanda as an example, I'm sorry, I follow uh, Tito Mboweni on Twitter and his cooking channel that's to be coming soon. Uh, <laughs> but if we look at how they leverage technology, that's important. It's not about what new markets can be created, it's about how do we serve our customers, consumers, including us as citizens, better. It's about bringing back respect. We talk about trust, and I'm always interested that we talk about trust because we can see what happened to Facebook and the US. Data. But we also talk about the fancy devices, your iPhone, your, your Samsung phones, all of these things, the fancy watches. Internet of things. How many doors do we have? These are all doors into your house, windows into your house. I speak about this in the context of cybersecurity. We're quick to adopt, but we're quick to say, oh, that's my data. You know, when Poppy came into ACT, how many people were phoned randomly and asked, so what's your ID number? My login for many things was my ID number. Now you want to tell me it's mine. I think it's a bit late. Who am I married to? I hope my wife still. Uh, okay, yeah, I hope so, if she listens. But otherwise, where is my ID number going to? So I think we must be just be, be pragmatic about some of the stuff that we see seeing coming out. 
Um, and I'll talk about dynamic operating decisions and some examples. I think that's what many people are looking for, is we are those concrete examples. I was speaking to a behavioral economist again and saying, we are the concrete examples of behavioral science coming to fruition to assist organizations. Let's rather engage with those because I think it's a fascinating area, but how? And that's what we need to really get into. So I'll quickly get into it. We've all seen this, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, my academic colleagues here, we, we can have a long, longer lunch, 20 minutes more, Lou, if you don't mind. But is this another in, uh, revolution? Why are we numbering it and all of that? We've got our opinions. But what I want to really point out is specifically this one here, is that we've now entered into this impact on society is bigger than impact on industry. That's the shift. That's the massive shift is that technology now enables and gives the power to the consumer and the citizen rather than to the corporation. For the first time, all of a sudden, business has this thing called customer experience, user experience. Now they want our input. Just hold on, now. I'm a bit young, so in the 90s you didn't want my input, but now, so Manaj, how did you experience that? Oh, and then you're gonna design your product or service around my experience. Who's got the power now, ladies and gentlemen? Right, and I think this is a fundamental shift because we also interconnected the internet. We can start complaining and we can start doing all of these things very, very quickly. So I think this is what I'm pressing this entire talk on here specifically. Big data, we've heard this term a lot. Um, I think there's quite a bit of confusion around it, so I'll quickly define it. Uh, traditionally, it's uh, data that is far too complex or large, complex and dynamic for conventional data tools to capture, store, manage, and analyze. I think it's poor, because big data is not about size. It's really about the ability to take it away from size and talk about its ability to search, aggregate, and cross-reference data sets. And when we talk about data sets, many people automatically think numbers. We've got to start abstracting away from that, because big data is really about taking words, which is text, numbers, images and voice as data sources overlaying them on top of each other to be able to come up with a true understanding of what that data subject is about. Because I'm not a number. I've got a personality, I hope. Okay? And I've got how I look, how I speak. Those are all inputs into the data. For artificial intelligence and all of these nice things to work properly, you can't take a single data source. A sample of one has always been a bad idea, ladies and gentlemen. You've got to be able to understand that people are made up differently. We are multidimensional. And so we must understand that big data is really about different types of data as well. And then the analytical, the identification of patterns. You know, every time I think of machine learning algorithms that come up with these things, don't expect your machine learning algorithm to come up with anything different than what you've programmed it to come up with. Didn't Einstein say that's the definition of insanity or stupidity, whichever one you like, right? Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that because without understanding what are the implications is that we don't end up with variance, we end up with convergence, which means that we treat everyone in every segment exactly the same. That's a real reason and a real fear that I have from a data analytics perspective. But this really starts highlighting something big for me, is how do we handle big data in a rapidly changing environment? Uh, you know, normally, probably about January or last year sometime, you could say the South African conte uh, context was highly complex. But let me show you what we believe is complex in the world. If the current rate of change and complexity were to remain constant, and this I take from an astrophysicist, so I'm going to take it as the truth, uh, were to remain constant, we would, have, we would have experienced all the major milestones of the 20th century in a single week in 2025, ladies and gentlemen. The week is still going to be seven days. The day is still going to be 24 hours. Let's see what are we looking to, 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 uh, to undergo here. The creation of the car. First and Second World War and the Vietnam War, decoding of the DNA structure, nuclear energy, space travel, the internet, human genome sequencing, all happening in a single week. The internet has fundamentally changed the way we do business and how we communicate with each other. You want to talk about complexity, we ain't seen nothing yet. That's the difference. Each and every one of these events here has fundamentally changed how we view the world. It's changed how we behave as well. So when we start thinking about data and big data, it's the ability to be able to get through this complexity. What are the fundamental trends that we may see into the future? And analytics is postulated to be that, uh, that answer. Analytics, I think, has been elevated to a stage to be the gospel truth now. 
And people are keep saying, where's the answer in the data? The data is not going to just give you an answer. It's asking the right question, which is a human thing. That's the difference. So that's the big thing here. And we have all know about this, about big data. We heard about the, four, the three Vs first, and then there was a fourth V. And the true academic, I added another V, value. Cut through every V. Let us understand what is that value. Because otherwise, business and practitioners don't care about it. It becomes an abstract concept because what is value? If we talk about value in this case here, it's generally we're talking about return on investment, efficiency gains, because it affects the bottom line. We've seen some of the banks, sorry, Sagan, how are you? <laughs> From Standard Bank closing down branches to go digital, uh, what efficiency does that have? It's got a cost on the other side, but it's a sunk cost. But we've got to be able to understand what data allows us to do is move. It's not going to give us the answer, but it allows us to move from uncertainty into something called a usable probability. That's what it allows us. There's a 60% chance of this happening, or there's an 80% chance of that happening, instead of, I don't know. That's what data gives us. Some sort of certainty, but it's a usable probability. I'm going to flip through the next three slides very quickly, so please just keep your eyes open. I know you generally get hungry around this time. I am right now. Uh, this was the big data landscape in 2012. Fast forward to 2016. Fast forward to 2017. And it's not because I don't know how to do slides, ladies and gentlemen. Is that what happened here is that we saw many, or many companies being spawned to be able to leverage what's happening in this environment. I often get asked, uh, what is the ideal tech stack? And my answer is two bottles of wine, blindfold, and a bunch of darts. Choose. Because they will all integrate very easily. That's what will happen, right? And this is the reality. This landscape has fundamentally changed. I've been looking for the 2018 ones, not out yet. Um, but I also want to just bring about, in 2012, we didn't even add on. Let's go back here, your Internet of Things, as a data source at the bottom. Here, it starts making an appearance. Just have a look at that. And then fast forward to 2017, and look at those data sources down there now. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where we always talk about data. And I just want to pause here because I see there's many big companies in the room here, and this is always a bugbear for me specifically. In massive organizations, how do we structure our analytics departments, whether we call them business intelligence services, advanced analytics, whatever fancy name you want to give it? We make it a standalone business unit like this. I don't know what profit they're generating, but okay. Ideally, if you see successful companies, do not structure analytics in a department this way. They overlay it and embed it across the organization. That's when you see the value. Not when it's a standalone, or you have a center of excellence and you've got a wheel that's hub and spoke it out. Nothing else. So I just wanted to bring this up because I've got to talk about some IoT as well. And if we look at this here, Google sometimes lies to us, but not all the time. But let's have a look at this search interest in data terms over time via Google Trends. Uh, I think we've seen a massive shift here. Specifically, we saw big data ramping up about 2015. We started seeing it come down, and then we started seeing this data science go up, and I'll talk about that beast or the unicorn called the data scientist briefly. And then we've seen the other one, artificial intelligence, plonking up. Why do I use Google Trends here? And I always say it's perception. People's perception actually drives some adoption. If you think about this here, and I use my wife as a good example. Yesterday she sent me some WhatsApp pictures of tackies or shoes that she wants. Um, I know this weekend she's going to buy it. It's intention to per intent, right? Uh, so by, by saying, I just want to find out, it's because you're really interested in this thing. And I know she's going to buy it, and I know my credit card is going to cry, but in any case. But what we've seen, and why have we started seeing moving from big data, and we're seeing an uptick in this, this unicorn called data science, or this field called data science, is because it was always there to give us some big hope. This is what it's really about, ladies and gentlemen. Without big data, analytics companies are blind and deaf, wandering out uh, onto the web like a deer on a freeway. That's what it's all about here. Information is the new oil of the 21st century, and analytics is the combustion engine. And then we saw the economists come up with a nice cover page saying that data is the new oil of the 21st century. I don't buy it because oil has a one-to-one -one relationship. Am I right, Rashin from Shell? You use it once, it's done. Data has a one-to-many relationship. That's the difference. Massive difference there. And so there's some big hope, but the big question still stood. 
We're in a rapidly, we are rapidly entering a world where everything can be monitored and measured. The doctors even told us that now, right? But the big problem is going to be the ability of humans to use and analyze and make sense of the data. Let that sink in. The technology is cool to collect it. How do we use it? Because if you're not going to use it, why did we collect it in the first place? Are machines going to make those decisions for us? We can help them if you want to program them to do that. But understand, by programming a machine to analyze all this data, you're going to come to the same point again, over and over again. And that's the big issue that we have. And so what we saw is this big emergence of the data science field coming up, and then this little beast, ladies and gentlemen. The data scientist, the sexiest job of the 21st century, as our colleagues at Harvard told us. Someone gave me the label. So just to let you know, this is what the new sexy looks like. <laughs> Not that, but this, okay? So we're trying to shift people's perception of sexy. Uh, there's been a massive uptick in this job here, but it is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Everyone's looking for a data scientist to do what? Make sense of the data. How many of us then believe them? No, you don't understand business. But can you see how important these things become now? Uh, so I think that just from a big data perspective, and let's just briefly talk about this Internet of Things. By definition, it's just connected physical op uh, objects. And it's a thing, ladies and gentlemen, that collects and transfers data over the Internet without sort of any manual intervention. So we know that this thing is syncing to my phone, syncing to somewhere else, and I don't know who else knows how many steps I've taken in a day. That's where it basically sits. And that's where we're seeing much of this go ahead. And then we've seen the rise of the Internet of Things. I think we've seen the hockey, fair, hockey stick effect going up this way here. All the connected devices. You know, there's the whole thing about Alexa in your home and everything else and all the nice devices. That's good for all of us. But there's a massive population out there that has no access to any of these Internet of Things. How do we use the patterns if we can? to understand how we behave and how do we make sure that other people can also behave in the same ways by transferring and making inferences based on the data that we have. We keep talking and we keep forgetting about a large portion of the African continent, people that are living below the poverty line. Angelo showed Gapminder, what Hans Rosling, the late Hans Rosling used to say, below the washing line. Because it's the $2 per day. Who said it's $2 per day? Because on the African continent, we say you live below the poverty line when you're under $1 per day. So which data do you look at? How big is our poverty problem? And then how do we give, use technology to get access to services? And that for me becomes the big, 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 big question. And so the IoT devices that we all use and we all see is simply an added data source, ladies and gentlemen. I'm being very pragmatic about it. It gives us some intelligence. We'll show, and I'll show you the example of our fancy watches, but it's, a it's an added data source. And the question for me is, what are we doing with that data at any level? And so more importantly, what we're seeing is some convergence in manufacturing. We're seeing dynamic pricing models come up. Number two for me is very interesting. We can uh, remotely operate cons uh, customers' equipment more efficiently. And I've got the words Giza IoT there. It's involved in this project by putting IoT devices on people's Gizas to be able to predict when a Giza is about to burst, because that's a big problem for the insurers specifically. Not the cost of the Giza, but the collateral damage, essentially. And that becomes a big issue. Uh, we were getting quite accurate at it, and then what was happening, the insurer could remotely switch off the Giza. So now I'm saying, okay, if the Giza bursts and you didn't switch it off, who's liable? Do you see how that now shifts the question? So how much control do we really want over these things? Uh, predictive maintenance, so we've seen what Air France has done. For government, I think smart cities has got to be the way forward. I think in Johannesburg right now, you know that we're under some 54-hour thing that, you know, changing a valve. But, uh, preventative maintenance is massive, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's been quantified, I think, in Johannesburg alone. By sitting in traffic, you lose about 11 days of productive work. 11 days. That's why I love Investec, who's now come up with a new HR policy. Did you hear about that? I think it's, it's quite cool. Um, my boss isn't here. I see she's left. Hint, hint. Okay. Um, the other one here, but what is less clear is how organizations in their uh, uh, steeped in their current business models are going to change. I always ask this question, are you ready to have your Kodak moment, companies? Because what we are seeing fundamentally is the rise of what we call global monopolies. We've seen this. Apple's going to become a bank. Hold on. They provide you with a phone. 
Not even connect, just the phone. Now they want to get into banking. Who the hell are they? Okay, Discovery. Let's just pick on Discovery for a little bit because I paid my premium yesterday. Uh, <laughs> you guys were supposed to give me health insurance, cool, because I could afford it. Now you've even got a banking product. And I was laughing at Ryan Notch at the gym. Yes, I do go to the gym and said, how many kilometers must I run for my statement then, right? I mean, that's the new, <laughs> because you guys have the integrated uh, business model, right? The more products I have with you, the cheaper it becomes, am I right? Huh? Simujiv is just uh, winking at me, okay? But those are new business models. And when we see these new business models rise, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Is we're all taken aback and saying, wow, that was innovative. No, all they've done is flip them, the, the, the thinking behind the organization. Nothing else. Many of our organizations are steeped in current business models, which unfortunately does not make sense and does not make us future fit. And so we need to understand how IoT as an input into big data fundamentally affects business models and is steeped in what we call the resource-based view of the firm. Ladies and gentlemen, it's no big wonder globally and not only in emerging markets that there's a dearth of skills in critical areas. It's not a South Africa problem. It's not an Africa problem. It's a global problem. We know that we sit in a resource-constrained world. We can look at that from a climate change perspective. We can look at that from any perspective. So how do we operate our businesses more be or better using a different business model when we have constrained resources. How do we reorganize our resources to be able to leverage what may be in the future? And that for me is going to be critical. And I'll show you some of the thinking and some of the research that we've put out on this. We're seeing three emergent properties specifically around cost value, experience value, and platform value. Now, I'm not talking to traditionally just about platform businesses here. And this here for me, I'm always worried when I put up the slide specifically, because many companies think they're now information technology companies, IT companies, tech companies. Not every one of your companies is a tech company. Let's just keep strict to our core, nothing else. That's one of the things that we start seeing. And then we're starting to see the emergence of this here, which is the emergent business property that I've got. Been running at Gibbs for about four or five years now, research around the critical components of this. And what we're really starting to see is value delivery, value capture, value architecture, resource competency, data and analytics, and value network. Our value network is important because it's about creating ecosystems. It's about being able to let your entire supply chain speak to itself by itself. But hold on, Walmart did that a long time ago. It's not new. Walmart has done it. So how do we make sure that we can deliver something to someone at the time in the, uh, in the, in the, in the time of need? That's what's important here. And so the big imperative still remains. What are we doing with our data here? Data that is that's, uh, that's unused is no different from data that was never collected. And then I love this little one here. Let's solve this problem by using big data. None of us have the slightest idea to what to do with. How many of our organizations, and it's about feature engineering. I think Andy has raised this here. It's about bring, bringing up those critical features that really make an impact on what we're trying to solve. Hold on, what are we trying to solve? That's a human thing that we need to define. And if we don't define that, data is not going to give us any answer. We're going to end up with what we call spurious correlations. And so that brings us into these emerging technologies. This, I just took a screenshot of this. These are the top 30 emerging technologies. All top five require data. Each and every one of them. And what's really happening, ladies and gentlemen, more at an individual level, is this thing called the Internet of Things, number two, which is sensors and the wearables that you and I wear. And how do we start embedding it? Our doctors have shown that. But this is really driving a change in human condition. It really is. All of us here in this room are guilty. Let's look at some of the work that's been done around this. What does it mean? Because I knew Angelo is going to talk about Android, I said I'm going to go iOS. Just because I like them. No, I'm joking. Okay? But have a look at this. Anyone with an iOS phone will be given their screen time. Why do they give us a screen time? Just to show how unproductive you are. What apps you, I don't know. Um, but the reality is here is looking at a growing, uh, address growing concerns around increasing uh, device usage. There's a thing called smartphone addiction. Gone about, gone, Alcoholics Anonymous, gone. It's smartphone addiction. I'll never forget a few years ago, I was with my wife at Rosebank, and there were teenagers that were walking in a line this way, and each and every one of them was like this. And I was, asked my wife, so why the hell are they even here together? How many of us catch ourselves doing that? There's this thing, and it's a big problem. And this whole thing about digital health. So as much as digital is good, we've got to be careful about the impact that it has on in, an individual's health. And the reality that exists. 
we love talking about technology, ladies and gentlemen, and I don't think anyone in the world can put up their hand and say, I've got a proper handle on what the technological landscape looks like. It's evolving far too quickly. That's the problem. And the problem that we have with technology is that that's how it's growing, and our ability to adapt is at that space there. Which leaves us, unfortunately, with a gap. And then we talk about the regulator. The regulator, on average, from a technological space is about three to five years behind. So you've got three to five years to really make a lot of money and then shut down. That's my philosophy, right? <laughs> but let's have a look at that, okay? And that's what I see as the biggest, uh, the big problem and the reality that's there. Strategic planning, and I'll go through this quite quickly here, is that I think it's, we've, we're seeing a space of rapid innovation, innovations to gain market share and faster scaling uh, than those that are only clinging to sort of physical uh, business models. I came across a term called fidgetal. My God, fidgetal. Physical plus digital. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy. I heard it for the last time last uh, I heard it for the first time last week. My word, I was thrown aback. Eh? I think I lost the rest of the 60 minutes of the meeting. I was like, fidgetal. fidgetal. I even Googled it <laughs> to see what it was. And I think it's it's a fascinating concept. Because it really says, because at some stage, do you remember? Everyone said that e, the brick and mortar was going. Huh? South Africans, do you remember? Yeah, gone. And then what happened? Amazon decided to open up some physical stores. Yay, hold on. They are single-handedly playing with our minds. When they showed us that e-commerce wins, they went and bought Whole Foods and then they did Amazon Go. Hold on, I thought you were playing in that space. Now you want to play in the brick and mortar space. You guys are just playing with us now. Okay, yes, there's distribution channels and all of that going on as well. But I think there's some big things is that we need to rethink the way the concept of an organization, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to understand that it's just simply about us interacting with a whole bunch of actors and players in this space here. So it's really about coordination across all activities. There's three inferences that we've picked up specifically that come into play now from a strategy and strategic planning perspective. Number one is that we know that there's an information explosion. Number two is the distribution cost. It's tending towards zero. That's just the reality. Seeing the emergence of new ecosystem and the world is becoming digital at a faster pace. That's the first inference. The second, most companies have to globalize in order just to be sustainable. I'm not saying beating the competition just to be sustainable. That's the big thing that comes out now. And here we see the ability to collect, collate, process data and draw inferences from global trends and markets would just be the basic ticket to play in the market. In other words, you've just got your hand on the door handle, nothing else. And the last, and we've seen, I think, uh, Bitcoin, the first emergence of digital currencies, and I'm going to keep banging this on for many, many years. I think that's going to become a real thing, and we've seen what Facebook has done with Libra. And the last one here is businesses have to cope with an increasing number of interdependent variables. In other words, what I'm not going to call, what I'm going to call the butterfly effect. A small chain somewhere else has a ripple effect down the line. Nothing is only industry dependent now. The fundamental changes that happen in the macroeconomic environment that happens in the isolated place in Russia, as an example, or Alaska, can affect your business. And we need to be cognizant of that. Dynamic operating, uh, uh, dynamic operating decision making, I think um, this is where machine learning for me really comes into the play. Um, we've all heard of seeing these two big companies, Alibaba and Amazon, we've heard about them roughly. I just want the one stat, because I'm a statistician, to just let sink in. Singles Day 2017 for Alibaba alone, was more than double of what all US retailers made on Black Friday and Cyber Monday in 2017 combined. So everyone familiar with Singles Day in, uh, in China? It's on the 11th of November, 11111, right? There's only two things that come to mind, or one thing that comes to mind is a lot of single people buying themselves presents in China on Alibaba's channels, right? That's the only way. Just let that sink in, ladies and gentlemen. It's massive. Alibaba is massive. But then let's just contextualize that a bit. Existing population, China is a bit bigger, hey? Internet users, many more. It's only the size of the economy that's slower, uh, smaller. And, but we also understand that China has got a closed economy. It's largely a closed economy. So we must be careful when we start looking at these here. But what we are seeing is how does, what can we learn from Alibaba from an organizational perspective? Because to address poverty, to address better health outcomes, to address all the problems that we face in emerging markets, if our companies can do good, 
we can charge them a lot more tax, right? Let's just be open and honest with each other. More money into the economy, more money that SARS or the revenue services can appropriate to services that we need. That's just the basic equation. And so how do they do this here? And, and what we learn is that you've got to datify every customer exchange. Smart business capture all the information generated during exchanges and communications and let the algorithms figure it out. Because unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, none of us here were built to deal with complexity. We see data, we get confused. I'm still trying to look at an Excel spreadsheet with numbers on there. And you know in the matrix, that movie where stuff just appears? Doesn't happen. So we've got to get some processing done. That's number one. Number two, you've got to software every activity. Think reactivity in real time. What does that mean? Build a model of how humans currently make decisions. Because I'm sorry to say this, all senior managers in the room and executives in the room, you still make the decisions based on your same historical way of making decisions. It's difficult to change human behavior that way. So why don't you just let a machine do it for you, come to the same conclusion, relatively, okay? Then the third and the fourth one is get data flowing. I spoke about this one here in terms of structuring your analytics departments. And the last one here is apply algorithms. In other words, automate. So the question is, if these four ways allow you to be able to leverage good impact for your bottom line, in combination with your three inferences that I spoke about for strategic planning, the question is how? And quite simply for me, the how is machine learning. That's what it's about. And what is machine learning? We talk about it quite often, but it's really about by feeding data and information in the form of observations of in real world interactions. Let it just come out. Let there be some stuff. Because if we use machine learning to help us make decisions, I'm choosing my words very carefully, help us make decisions then it becomes a powerful tool. Expecting a machine to make the decision for you, why are we employing you again? That becomes the question. Because it's still a human that needs to make an, uh, a rational, oh, no, I don't want to say rational, but make a decision based on the context within which they're operating. And so some examples briefly here about what we've seen out there. Uh, resource constraint crowdsource. I think we talk about resource constraint on the emerging market context, but developed markets have resource constraints. Let's look at Yelp and the city of Boston. They use uh, machine learning using Yelp reviews. People give up the information quite freely. How many of you comment and post stuff? Social media? Yeah. I didn't like that thing. We mined the data. And what they did is a 25% rise in the number of spot inspections that uncover violations. You don't need to chuck more resources at things. You leverage the existing resources. The next one that pops up here is connecting for customer value under Armour. They sensors in and track all the activity, more personalized experiences. That's what they're doing. They're using your data and feeding it to you back in a manner that you can use it at a personal level. Uh, we've heard from the doctors around Google flu trends who are trying to predict the outbreak of a flu. Yes, it was a bit of a failure. But what can we learn from that failure and how do we now move that forward? The last one here, this one here, we've all known the fancy devices, the watch and the iPhone here. Anecdotally, I've heard one example where someone's watch had actually pinged them in a meeting to say that their heart rate had gone above an acceptable level. One. Okay? But the reality is, is that that saved one person's life. That's what it did. Because this was a heated meeting and they realized the heart rate had gone up and that thing had stopped him. It stopped him. It really, you know, he looked at this thing and he realized, hold on. This is what's happening. So I think we've got to start looking at this here. So if, if these re alerts become regular occurrence and what's uh, sensors and operating properly, you wholeheartedly recommend it to make an appointment with the doctor. Can you see we're not replacing them? We're simply telling you before you realize it's too late and you've fallen down, go and see your doctor. That's what we're doing. And what, as much as we do it for aeroplanes and in the manufacturing industry, what we're doing is for us. The question for me is how do we get it low cost enough to make sure it's accessible for everyone? That's the trick here. And then this one here is an impact on parenting. I had to put this one up after I heard about uh, the crying from Elton. I think Elton spoke about it. Um, just look at what these individuals did here. It's, it's called an infant cry baby analyzer. I do not, I've got a story behind it, but I, I have no shares in the company. But they collected uh, the, the crying sounds of 200,000 babies from newborn babies. And you can tell you if is hungry, tired, in pain, and has a wet diaper. Takes 15 seconds of the app listening to crying to make the analysis. 92% accurate in infants under two, two weeks and 85 under two months. How many of you have children here? <laughs> At three o'clock in the morning, do not tell me about parenting and you should know the babies cry. <laughs> 15 seconds. 
change the nappy, good to go. I bought this for my brother-in-law and his wife gave birth. And all my friends said I was a cheapskate. I was like, it saved him sleep time, guys. Okay. Um, this one here, everyone's familiar with these guys here. This time they didn't even get that far as the semifinals. Um, but we can also analyze, and the reason I show this here is because we, from an image perspective, is we can understand our people's faces and what images and what emotions uh, sit behind that through data analysis. What can we do is make sure that we have targeted advertising that goes out at the right time through the right channel at, uh, um, to the right people. And that's the right offering at the right time through the right channel, nothing more than that. But it's all data driven. We watch people, their facial reactions. And that's important because if there's something that I've realized is that your face never lies. Even the poker players. That's why they wear glasses. Okay, and then this one here about, um, and I'm almost done here, Lou, um, measuring the impact of personalized recommendations. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, Alibaba eventually on the 15th of May went public with it. They beat the estimates as personalized recommendations boost sales. And it's not because if you bought a toilet seat yesterday, they're recommending you another toilet seat. It's about offering you the complimentaries to a toilet seat. The stuff that you ordinarily wouldn't have thought about buying, they end up buying. There have been very smart mechanisms around this here. But for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, data can now be a profit and loss and say this is how much we've contributed to the bottom line. It's the first time. They said it increased their sales by, I think, 56.3%. Give or take me 2% if I miss the number there, but about 50% of that sales. So I think it's a massive way to start looking at it. The ability to provide products and services just in time based on evidence, data. Okay, from multiple sources remains the aim. And that becomes critical. Three fundamental capabilities that we do require here, hyper-awareness, informed decision-making, and fast execution. Uh, gone, in the organizational terms, a long time to, uh, to make decisions. If we don't change our capabilities and how we do these things to leverage at the data that we have, we're going to lose it. And so some of the key concerns quickly, um, IoT and different standards. I use a very crude example for the South Africans. The more connected devices simply means more doors and windows for robbers. Let's understand that. The more connected devices you have, the more options hacker has to enter in. So I hope that metaphor resonates with that image. That's what it is. Um, look at all the hits that we've seen. 46% of cyber breaches are due to employees. HR. HR. What are we going to do about this? Okay. Average number of days to detect a, a breach by industry. I've got them here. Healthcare takes 255 days, yet it's the, probably the most sensitive data you can have on a person outside of your bank statements. Two, that's a whole year. Okay. Um, other problems that we have is leadership and talent management. More data does not lead to success, and I think we must just be clear about that. A company culture, I don't think this is going to change very quickly. It's difficult to change something that's intangible. And the most dangerous phrase in the language is we've always done it this way. We can talk about AI. We can talk about machine learning, ladies and gentlemen. But unless you don't have a grasp on what your data is, where it comes from, how you plan on using it, stop collecting it. Uh -huh.